Imagine a crystal, and this crystal or prism has seven different sides to it. And as you peer into this crystal, you get a blue hue shining into your eyes. But as you slowly rotate this crystal and see a different facet of it, a pink hue emits into your eyes. And you can keep rotating this same crystal seven different ways, and you can get seven different lights blasting into your cornea. That is relative modulation. Well, that's an analogy to relative modulation. If you think about a major key, that's like our prism. And our major key can be rotated seven different ways, and we can create seven different, completely different environments or modal tonalities out of that one key. That's relative modal shifting. It sounds very complicated, but it's extremely easy. And in this video, I'm going to show you how I think about rel rel relative modal shifts, how we actually use them. I've written an entire song here that goes through three of them, and then we'll discuss some other examples of this kind of thing happening as well. So let's begin with just the C major scale, which is just C, D, E, F, G, A, B. Hopefully you know, with just these notes, these are the triads that I can build. I'm allowed to build C, D minor, E minor, F, G, A minor, B diminished. We give these numerals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So that's their name now. Their name is now 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And here's the deal with the modal shift. This is our prism. This is our seven-sided prism. And if we decide to peer through this facet, we're going to get a major tonality. To do that, it means we need to basically start on C major, use a lot of C major chord. C major needs to be the, the most prominent chord in the mix, and we'll be getting that C major light out of our prism. We'll be in the key of C major. But if we decide, nah, 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 I'm going to focus on the two chord. I'm going to use all these notes. I'm going to use all these chords, but I'm really going to focus on D minor. Well, guess what? You wouldn't be in C major anymore. You'd be in D Dorian. Yes, the key is the same, but we wouldn't describe it as C major. We'd describe it as D Dorian. Now, here's how I've created a Dorian tonality. What I've done is decided to play the D minor chord and then the G chord, just back and forth. That's how my song starts, D minor, G. So there's no reason anyone would mistake it for being the key of C. There's no C chord present. So why would somebody call this the key of C major when we're not even playing a C major chord? It would be better to call it D Dorian. And to spice up my chord progression, here's what I have did. My D minor chord is created by just taking the note D here and skipping it out. And I get D, F, A. That's a D minor chord. All right. What I can do, let's double this scale so we see it twice in a row now. What I can do is I can add another note to that D minor chord. I can just extend it. So I'll have D, F, A, C. Those four notes together give me a D minor 7, which I personally think is much more flavorful than just my regular D minor. So instead of playing D minor, I'm extending it to D minor 7. Likewise, instead of playing just a G chord, I'm going to extend it. Let's say, uh, I don't have perfect pitch, so these aren't the right notes, but it would be G, B, D. That's a G major chord. And if we keep going G, B, D, F, that we have a G7. And if we skip again to the note A, G, B, D, F, A. Well, now we have a G9 chord. All those five notes, G, B, D, F, A, that spells out a G9 chord. This is my Dorian progression. This should not be described as the key of C major. This should be described as the key of D Dorian. And let's take a listen to that key of D Dorian, where we're just playing D minor 7 and G7. Let's take a listen to that, all right? And here's all we've got is just a guitar part and some keyboards playing the exact same chords. So as you can hear there, we just have D minor 7 and G9, and those are also being played by a keyboard as well. Now, to turn this into an actual groove, here is the kind of steps that I take. Me personally, I really want to have drums involved as I'm recording and writing. It just gives me a lot more energy, makes me feel a lot better when I'm playing. So to me, the first step was making sure that I include some drums. So here is the same guitar part, but now we've included a drum beat instead, um, and it sounds like this. Pretty easy, you know, basic stuff. I've got the snare coming in on the four beats only, which gives it a lot of space. Um, now, after that, uh, more percussion always helps. So I have a bongo pattern um, that's pretty classic. If you listen to this bongo pattern, I'm pretty sure I stole it from like an 80s dance tune, but listen to this bongo pattern. 
So we've got some bongos, we've got some shakers, which just, in my opinion, adds an incredible amount of energy. So if we kind of add that in there as well, take a listen. I mean, that has a lot more motion, a lot more energy. Now the bass is really important for this kind of stuff. So let's just listen to our bass all on our own. You can kind of imagine how this outlines the chords. And with everything involved. And it's just two chords, B minor seven to G. All right, and you can hear that gives me a chance to play some Dorian leads on. Now, when I'm playing this guitar solo, this improv guitar solo, I'm thinking of the D Dorian scale. That's what I'm thinking the entire time. Are we in the key of C? Yes, but I'm not thinking of C. I'm, their C is not important here. So when my fingers are on my guitar, I'm thinking, hmm, where's my D minor chord? Oh, where's my D Dorian scale? That's where my brain is at the entire time for this section. But in my opinion, for an instrumental, you don't just want to do improvised leads all over the place. I think it's really important to have some nice, uh, defined melodies. So I did make some actual melodies here. Very consistent. It's just, you know, A and then B. It's almost the same melody, but it's different. A, B, and then I do it again. A, B. So it's just kind of back and forth between this melodic idea on an uh, auto wah clavichord, but it sounds really nice. So if we start this from the beginning, you can hear how this is a great intro to a Dorian tonality, right? Just the two chords, little bit of rhythm, melody. Now a guitar solo. Now what do you think is going to happen here? Hmm. How about a relative modal shift? And what we're going to do... C major. Who doesn't like C major, right? So that right there was our relative change to C major. Obviously, the same chords, same key, didn't change any of these notes, same seven notes, but what did I do? I fell into a C major chord, and specifically, I made it a C major seven chord because it's beautiful. Same way, just taking C, E, G, and then adding another note, B, gives me a C major seven. The next chord I go to is an F major 7, um, and also an F major 9 sometimes, but we'll just call it, yeah, we'll just call it F major 9. So this is my chorus section. My chorus section is in the tonality of C major. And how good does it feel to be in Dorian and then to go back to major, to go from Dorian to major? To me, it's like those are natural counterparts. Dorian is smoky and nasty and kind of groovy and a little, you know, a little bright, but C major is just relaxing and bright. So we've got these, we've got these two kind of, two rooms we can go to in the house. We don't have to stay in one room all day. We're allowed to go to the, the smoking room or we're allowed to go into the garden, right? I feel like uh, the, the, the smoking room is Dorian and the, uh, the, the garden would be uh, the major scale instead. Now, just as quickly as we popped in to C major with nothing, we didn't do any chords, we just went there, right? We can pop right out of it. So here's C major and let's pop right back into Dorian again. And let's hear, let's hear how that changed. So now we're going from C major right back to Dorian, literally just a copy paste of our earlier section. But instead I have the guitar solo happen first and then the melody happen second. So let's listen again, C major now. Hopping back to D Dorian. That's just nasty. Here's our melody again.
And what do we do? Back to C major. Beautiful, right? My melody here, by the way, look at my melody. Very simple. Almost the same thing three times in a row. All right. So let's take a quick look at this melody here. Um, basically the same kind of idea, da, 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 which looks like a pentatonic scale, I guess. Um, and we basically do the same thing again with just a little flourish. And then we do the same thing a third time, and I have the rule of three strikes and you're out. You can't do it a fourth time. You have to do something a little different that time. So we've done it once, we've done it twice, we've done it three times, and now we have to kind of go into some little random little, uh, you know, something different to conclude it. So that, uh, we've talked about three strikes and you're out rule in my videos before, especially in my course. I kind of harped on it on the, the part of melody. Um, but either way, what do we do next? Well, we've gone from major to Dorian. We've gone from major to Dorian. Why not bring in another extremely common shift? Why not just focus on the six chord? We haven't seen an A minor chord yet pop up, right? It's been missing this entire time. So what if we just focus on A minor? And then maybe we go back to E minor. And then A minor and E minor. You know, if you start the song right here, which is what you're about to hear. You're about to hear A minor to E minor. And if we hear this, just let's take a listen, all right? And we'll get rid of my solo for now, Let's, because it's not that great of a solo. It's all improvised, and uh, it's not that good. But let's, let's listen to the groove. If we started the song here, A minor, E minor. I mean, this is the key of A minor. Everyone in the world would tell you that, you know? If you ask any musician, hey, what key are we in? They're not gonna say C major, they're gonna say A minor. They're not gonna say D Dorian, they're gonna say A minor, because right now, guess what our tonal center is? A minor. So, you know, this is really important. We're not just talking about, you know, the whole song is one big picture, but we can divide that whole song into little bits and say, hey, you are C major, you are D Dorian, you are A minor. And then the question is, well, what key is the song in? The key signature is clearly C major, but it's not accurate to call the song the tonality of C major, right? The song shifts tonalities. And that's so important that, you know, people, I think people get confused that a song is just going to be in C major and like, that's all it can be. No, it can it can shift within that, you know, and it's very, very likely that it will shift, you know, and this is really common in like pop rock, a lot of pop rock. The verses are in minor and then the choruses are in major. The first song that's coming to mind is Mr. Jones and Me by Counting Crows, right? That ver those verse sections are cool and minor. And then the chorus comes up, Mr. Jones and me, and everybody's dancing, everybody's having a happy time, right? So that is a great example of a simple relative mode shift. If you listened to just the chorus, you'd say, hey, this song is in, I think that song is in C, yeah. I think you'd say, uh, this song's in the key of C. If you listen to just the verse, you'd say, oh, this song is in the key of A minor. So what key is the song in? Well, you get to use your own verbiage for that. Regardless, we take a relative modal shift to the tonality of A minor, which feels very comfortable. Take a listen. Here's C major. Oh, by the way, I brought in a two chord and a five chord, a diminished chord just to get me here. So here's where we're at. Six chord. Three chord. Six. Three. Again. And now, to help kind of switch things up, four, five, back to. Right back to this. It works, right? It's not the smoothest transition, okay? I will say that. That when we do this, it's not necessarily the smoothest transition to just go in there. But you know what? It still works. It's not like it's not like totally jarring. And once we get there, we're like, oh yeah, I remember this. We're in the same scale. We're using the same seven notes. Now, finally, to confuse things here, we have our last chorus. And the question is, what chord are we supposed to end on? There's no real answer. I think I think if we're ending with our chorus section, I feel like the right thing to do is end on C. Right? That feels like the right thing to do to end on C. But, you know, it's worth experimenting with ending on A minor or ending on the D minor instead. I just don't feel like because we're in the key of C for this section, 
it feels like the right thing to do to end on a C chord here. But you could end it on an A minor and have a spooky ending. You could end it on a D minor and have a confusing ending. Um, but it would work either way. I think because this is C, we'll end on C. But take a look at the structure of my song. Look at this is a three minute instrumental song, and it's very simple. We have our intro, which is just a skin graft of our verse, right? So verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, verse, chorus, end. That's it. Cookie cutter. And every one of these little things has a melody in it, right? Wait, the first half of this verse has a nice little synth melody. My chorus has a synth melody. The second half of my verse has a synth melody. So this is an instrumental, and I think it's the kind of thing that stands on its own. You don't need vocals, but when I write a song like this, I can't help but think, God, I, I really do want to have a singer on top of this. So I have a little bit more to talk about, but we might as well play this entire track all the way through. If you don't want to hear the thing, skip ahead exactly about three minutes. Um, but it sounds pretty good, and I'll play the mastered version instead of the version that's pumping out of my DAW instead. And we'll just kind of watch along. Um, as you can see here on the screen, you should be able to recognize um, those different sections. So kind of think about those sections as they come along. These are Dorian sections, major. Dorian, major. Minor. Dorian Major. All right. So a few things. Let's talk about the bad things about that track. Uh, I think the program drums work, but it would sound way better if we had a real drummer. I think the guitar solos uh, should be written um, if it's going to be an instrumental, or it should all be synth. I really like the synth elements to this. I feel like there's enough guitar with the rhythm in there as well. Um, and then the ending. I don't think it should end on a chord. I actually think that that ending chorus should continue through, and it should be a fade out with a lot more stuff going on there. So I don't think it actually should end on a single chord. I think it should just fade out. So this was something I made just for um, 
you know, I get distracted like this. I wanted to demonstrate ref relative modal shifts and I wanted to kind of talk about things and then I ended up making an entire song and then I was like, well, I want to make it kind of good. So this is good enough, you know, but um, it is something I'm going to save and maybe hold on to for later and get it just perfect because uh, it's a nice it's a nice little element here. It's a nice little nugget um, that I can work with. It's almost finished. It just needs it just needs some, you know, tightening up. But that's not the point. The point is, what are some other examples of the music that does this? It happens all the time in pop and rock where we shift between those relative changes. But the song that I want you to listen to is Boys of Summer by Don Henley. That one is in, I think the key is D minor. All right. Um, the verses are this cool, awesome driving streets at night D minor. And there's neon lights past. You. It's just a wonderful minor feel. One of my favorite minor feels ever. Um, that verse section for Don Henley's Boys of Summer, all right? Then the chorus comes in, and it's just beautiful relative major, F major. And we're just doing one, five, four, one, five, four. It doesn't get more major than that. Just And you get that elation for that chorus. Also, throughout this entire song, listen to the tambourine line. Try to figure out the tambourine line. It is a ridiculous tambourine line. It's pre I'm pretty sure it's like a... I don't know, it might be programmed or something, but I don't know if they had programmable tambourine machines when that song was written probably it's just a very very funny tambourine rhythm it's one of my favorites um good luck figuring it out it's actually a little tricky but that song hangs out long enough on the four chord for the bridge section for me to call it a relative lydian change the bridge section is just four five four four Five, four, that's basically it. And because of that, you get this like mystery and this wonder of what's gonna happen. Ooh, are the boys of summer returning? And no, you just get slammed back into minor. You know what I mean? It's just right back into minor. Now, I feel like if they had done that four measures less, I couldn't call it a relative change. If they did it four measures more, I could absolutely call it a relative change. But it's right there on the borderline for me. Like I don't, it's hard for me to classify it as because it's Lydian. Lydian's very delicate. So this is a fuzzy thing, you know? You, some people might not get this idea because they're not hearing the four chord as our new home base. Maybe they're just hearing the four chord as a departure from one. So there is a psychological component to this, too. It is kind of a uh, 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 subjective thing. You know, some people might be able to feel the two chord as home where some people aren't feeling it. And usually the reason that's going to dictate one or the other is how long did you spend there? It's really hard to feel you know, um, a new chord is the tonic if it's only there for a measure. But if you spend, you know, 16 measures on your four chord, yeah, it's going to feel like your home base, whether you like it or not. After a little while, it's going to kind of feel like, oh, this is where I belong. I think another good example is um, uh, Friend of the Devil, um, which is in the key of G major. But like the chorus section spends so long on D. It's D, D, C, C, D, D, C, C, D, A minor, C, D. And then you're back to G. And by the time you get there, it almost feels like you changed keys because like your brain reset to thinking of D mixolydian. You spent so much time on the five chord, you started thinking of the five chord as the one chord. So that is the whole point of relative changes. Hopefully this gets the point across that your major key, once you fully understand it, is just like a house with seven rooms in it. Let's throw away our crystal analogy. You have one house, but you have seven rooms in that house. Which which room do you want to spend time in? You know, if you want to be very depressed and cry all day, go into the minor room, you know? If you want to, uh, I don't know, explore, you know the mysteries of the past and, and study archaeology, go to the Phrygian room, you know what I mean, where you're keeping your artifacts from ancient Sumeria. Um, if you want to just hate your life, go to the Locrian room. I guess that would be like the bathroom or the, the unfinished basement would be Locrian. Um, you know, but your house has these seven rooms, and depending on how you're feeling, depending on what setting you want to provide yourself, you can just travel to one of those rooms, make it a priority, and, you know, it's not like your other rooms disappeared. You're just not spending as much time in there, and that will affect your mood. It will definitely affect your mood if you spend all day in the bathroom, and it'll, you know, change your mood if you decide to finally leave the bathroom and spend some time in the kitchen, for example. Sorry for all the analogies, but I think it's helpful to look at this in a lot of different ways. So, I hope this helped. This is the last part of the three-part lesson on modes I've done. The last one kind of focused more on parallel mode shifts. The first one was more of the general picture of things. This one is more on the relative mode shifts. So, I think I've covered almost everything. I know there's more questions on modal mixer. Um, I mean, to be honest, I still have more questions on modal mixer, but there should be enough answered here. So, 
Please let me know if you still have questions on modes. It'll probably be a while till I do a lesson just specifically on this topic, but I'm still very curious to see um, if you have any questions or comments uh, on this topic. So thank you so much. I will see you in the future.